That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Shane Ramey. You're listening to That Sober Guy podcast, and we help people stay sober. If it's your first time listening, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here today. Welcome to the first podcast, the first Sober Guy podcast of 2023. So excited to be here. Got a great conversation to share with you today. Our guests are my friends, Mr. Dan Carity, uh, Jeremy White, and Peter Stowe. Some great dudes all around. And uh, I want to share a little bit with you about these guys, just a little bit about their background. And I'll share a little context of how this conversation came to be, and then we will jump right in because we have lots of good stuff to cover today. Start with Dan. Uh, Dan Carity is a father, a husband. Um, he started as a dancer on Broadway and eventually transitioned uh, into choreography, uh, where, where he worked with uh, Britney Spears, NSYNC, Jessica Simpson, Justin Timberlake, Usher, many, many more. Uh, 2005. So you think you can dance? Debuted in the U.S. Y'all remember that show? And uh, Dan was a judge on it. And after three seasons, uh, he took the format to Europe and continues to judge. Numerous different talent shows all over the place. And uh, he also has an amazing podcast called If I'm Being Honest with Dan Carity, which I had the pleasure of being on uh, just a few months back. So uh, be sure to check that out. And Dan, just a great dude, man. I just want to thank him one more time for coming out all the way out from New Jersey to California. Uh, you know, I know he had some business down in Southern California, but instead of going straight there, he came up to Northern California just so we could hang out, just so we could do a podcast. And uh, we got to have some dinner together, him and his nephew, Ty, uh, who we brought with him. He was such a cool, cool dude too, uh, man. And we just got to have some Mexican food and just chop it up a little bit and just hang out, man. I just had such a great time doing that. So once again, man, I just want a big shout out to Dan, man, for, for rolling out for this. Um, Jeremy White, uh, Pastor Jeremy White, uh, man, just uh, just such a great dude. Um, joined at Valley Church here in Vacaville and uh, uh, went on as went on to become the lead pastor in 2009. Uh, and he did 14 years in youth ministry before that. Uh, Jeremy's just a great dude, man. He's just one, one of my good friends. We play a lot of golf together. And uh, man, you see Jeremy in church, and he's the same Jeremy that you're going to see out on the street in the community. Um, and that's one of the things I love about him, uh, just that authentic uh, human being that he is. So uh, great to have him on today. Uh, and then my uh, my other friend, Pastor Peter Stowe, uh, man, just an, another great, great dude here. Um, Peter's the pastor at the Father's House here in Vacaville for Kids Ministries. Um, and uh, man, him and his wife have an amazing podcast uh, it's a parenting podcast called the No Greater Joy Podcast. And uh, man, we, we've known the Stowe's for a long time now since the kids were little because our kids are all friends and they hang out and play sports together and um, and uh, they go to school together. And uh, Peter's just a great dude. He's got a lot of insight into parenting and, and marriage and um I just, uh, I'm just so excited to bring this group together with you guys today to share this convo we had. And uh, before we get to the podcast, really quick, do you want, maybe that's why you're listening today, you want to quit drinking for 30 days or more. The, that sober guy can help you do that with the Quit Drinking Dune 30 Day Alcohol Free Challenge. Uh, that sober guy 30 Day Challenge features 30 podcasts in 30 days to help keep you accountable. There's discussions in there, there's worksheets, exercises, uh, and it really focuses on helping men better understand why they're using alcohol. Why are you drinking? What are you trying to escape from? Um, we explore new ideas, relatable experiences, um, and then you also become part of the Sober Guy crew of like-minded men looking for freedom from alcohol. Uh, so sign up now by going to thatsoberguy.com. Uh, you'll get $10 off of the Quit Drinking Dude 30 day challenge when you do that. And while you're over at, while you're over at thatsoberguy.com, man, you can find more podcasts, you can find meetings, you can find resources, all kinds of good stuff on there. And please share it with a friend if you would. 
Uh, be sure to follow us on Instagram at that sober guy podcast. And then we'll put all the links from, uh, from the show today in the show notes. That way, if you want to connect with Dan, if you want to connect with Jeremy, if you want to connect with Peter, uh, it'll be very easy for you to do that and to make sure you follow all of their podcasts and, uh, and, uh, show them some love and some support too. They'd love to hear from you. So, uh, without further ado, let's get to the podcast. <laughs> Oh, and Cash Money's making beats in there. I can hear him. Sounds good, dude. <laughs> All right, fellas. Well, here we are. Just hit record. So nice. it's great to have you here tonight. Yeah. At the Raymer residence. Just had some dinner. Now we're going to do a panel podcast. I have no idea what we're going to talk about. We're just going to keep it, keep it organic, I guess. Maybe we start with some introductions. I don't know. Who is everybody? Who are you? Let's start here. Let's start with, with Peter here. Is this your first show of the year? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's nice. a great point. Welcoming the new year. Yes, thank right you. Because I thought about that today, and I've been really excited to do this. So let me actually first just say thank you guys for obviously Dan coming out from New Jersey, yeah. um, and Jeremy, Peter, just getting together, talking about some dude stuff. Um, this is the first podcast of the year for me, and uh, I'm I'm pretty stoked to actually do it because I was like thinking about quitting, like not. I was just kind of over it, you know. Yeah. And so I'm feeling some excitement. I'm feeling some um, some good things ahead. And uh, this is a great way to kick it off. Like I seriously couldn't couldn't think of three other dudes, you know, to have a great convo on a Monday night at eight o'clock. <laughs> Got Ty here. What's up, Ty? <laughs> yeah. Live audience. Yeah. Cash is hanging out. So yeah, we're going to have some fun tonight. We got lots of good things we're going to talk about um, from being dads to being husbands to um, trying to stay sober, um, just trying to be better human beings, I think, overall. Um, and uh, man, we'll probably kick some sports around, right? We got to talk a little sports. We got an A's fan, a Yankees fan, a Dodger fan, and a Giants fan all wow, at the same table. Right. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Meant to be. Yeah, I think so. The Dodgers win the World Series this year. Or was it a loss? No, I can't remember. No, I'm not even happen. talking smack either, but they made it to the World Series, I think. Uh, no. They're still holding on to 2020. Was that last year? That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, it was like whatever Wiped year. out in the first series by the Padres. But that's right. That's, that's what it was. History now. So Well, don't feel bad. At least you're not an A's fan because I'd spent since 1989. So that's right. It's been a long time. And it doesn't look like it's getting better anytime soon. Mm -mm. It's all getting worse. All three of our teams, besides the A's, the, the Giants, Dodgers, and New York, we all originated in New York. That's right. Yeah. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's true. Huh? crazy. We huh. used to be the New York Giants back in the day. Pretty cool. Who's been to New York other than Dan? I have. Man, I'm the only one. <laughs> that hasn't it's been. been years. I haven't been there yeah. in a while. Huh. The West oh. Coast kid. You haven't gone to the East Coast at all? I've been to Philly. Okay. Yeah, which was which was fun. But cool. I, never New York. Just been to New York. I haven't got to go yet. Do we go to um, games out here a lot? Yeah. You go actually to the games? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Because you have the, the luxury of going towards Sacramento, you know, Kings and stuff like that. Go to the Bay. You've got all the, the sports teams out there. Yeah. Uh, Dodgers are in town here about 10 times a year in Sa San Francisco. Yeah. And so I try to go see at least a couple of those. And then I had try to go to L.A. once or twice for a Dodger game as well during the season just when I can yeah. time it right. You know, that's a real fan when he'll go all the way down to Southern California for a game. <laughs> I've, I've driven down and back, too, in one yeah, turn. I remember you know. that. You went to a couple last year, I think. <coughs> And when we were down there, you came down to yeah. you in April, yep. which was cool. Yeah, I was telling uh, Dan at dinner, um, I became an Angels fan because it was ten dollars to park. So like, I pulled in and I was like, dude, it's ten bucks. Dang, I love the Angels. It's like so awesome. It's you like can't get a bottle of water for ten bucks there now. Uh, yeah, not now. No, that's it's it. Expensive. Man. Like Yankee Stadium is like mm -hmm. it's becoming off limits because it's so expensive to go to a game. Yeah, yeah, wow. it's ridiculous. I know. Yeah, I think. Um, I think I just realized too that four people on a podcast is pretty fun. And it's um it's not, you know, you don't do that a lot. I haven't done a lot of panel style podcasts with four different dudes. So I think what might help for those out there listening who, you know, maybe they're just tuning in or they don't know everybody here, why don't we just give a quick introduction to everybody and then we'll just jump into stuff. So cool. um yeah, I guess I'll, I'll start since I'm going. I'm Shane Raymer and That Sober Guy Podcast. Two kids, two cats. My dog just died. Oh, man, country song right there. Mm. And, uh, man, yeah, I'm, um, it's a new year, and I'm looking forward to having a great year this year. So um, I'm happy to kick it off with you guys. So, yeah. Love it. Pass it to Peter. My name is Peter, and uh, I am a friend of Shane Raymer. 
and a friend of uh, Jeremy White, and I'm learning to uh, meet the new friends at the table. But uh, our girls play sports together, me and Shane. Mm -hmm. So we've coached together and uh, go to church together. And uh, I got two kids and I'm married. I've been married for 15 years. And my full-time job is a pastor, but I do a lot of hobbies and and, uh, a lot of stuff that I enjoy. So yeah, you know, there's a lot of other things in there, but that's Podcasting, what about your podcast? Podcasting, my wife and I this last year uh, started a podcast called no greater joy and it's a parenting podcast so um with this new technology of podcasting i feel like everybody's doing it but uh it was a great way to talk to parents um where they're living you know parents are busy they're on the go Mm -hmm. i know as a sports family we are always on the move and so podcast just felt like a really great way to have conversations that are bite-sized and be able to talk to parents and so that's what we're doing nice Cool. Hey, I'm Jeremy. Um, I'm, I serve as lead pastor of uh, Valley Church in Vacaville. And um, I do, we do have a podcast, the Valley Church podcast. And primarily that's uh, uh, just uh, really, you know, our Sunday content and that kind of thing, messages and things like that. And I'm kind of toying with a couple of podcast ideas um, that I haven't decided which direction to go, but I've got a couple of cool ideas in mind. And so I'm kind of wrestling with that. And um, yeah, I'm married to April, 27 years this um, April. That nice. deserves a round of applause. And, yeah, uh, I was gonna say, kind I of I got one here. Yeah. I got one? And so, and just <laughs> actually, there it is. There thank it is. You. I tried, I tried. Appreciate it. <laughs> She'll appreciate it when she listens to this. <laughs> Shout out um, to you. Got three boys, uh, three almost grown boys, 23, 21, and 17. And my married son, uh, who's in the uh, Air Force, they just surprised us this uh, Christmas Eve uh, that we are going to enter into the new phase of grandparenting, Let's which go. I feel way too young for, but I'm excited. I'm excited. Are you going to so, be a grandpa, a papa? Uh, are you going to yeah. be El Padre? Well, so my be? daughter-in-law's dad, uh, actually, he's he's already a grandpa because they got she's got an older daughter with with some kids and so he's stolen papa already. So I'm going to have to figure out another name, but grandpa yeah. sounds a little old. So I'm, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm Googling like alternative <laughs> names for grandpa. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just met, but you don't look like a grandpa. I know. I, I, <laughs> yeah. That's like, that's so crazy, dude. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. It's yeah. pretty awesome. That Thank is you. awesome. Yeah. Thanks. All right. I'm uh, Dan Carity and I have the, if I'm being honest podcast, um, I have two kids married to a wonderful woman, Natasha. Um, and I'm sitting at this table cause, uh, I, I kind of stalked Shane. Um, <laughs> once I, when I got out of rehab, um, he was one of the first podcasts I found. Um, and I was, you know, still searching, trying to, trying to find my way. And so every morning I'd be in the gym and I would listen to whatever episode Shane had put out recently. And, um, and not long after that, I, I started sending him messages and just trying to meet up and, uh, you know, we just, uh, got to know each other, showed up on each other's podcasts and, yeah. When he brought up this idea of the, you know, the four of us just kind of doing a panel podcast, this is the kind of thing, you know, this is what I love about sobriety now for myself Mm. is I would have run in the other direction. (laughs) I would want nothing to do with being in the same vicinity with, you know, three other people and actually having a real conversation. And, you know, now I look forward to it. So uh, just happy to be sitting at the table and and having a chat. Yeah, that's great, dude. That's it's so uh, it's so funny how we think like uh, alcohol or substances or whatever it it cures social anxiety, I guess, for some people, or at yeah. least we think it do in some situations. Yeah. But um, same towards towards the end of that, I didn't want to be around anybody. Just leave me alone. You know, I don't yeah. I don't want to deal with any of that stuff. You know, it actually brought more social anxiety, I think, um, which is interesting, but. Um, what, one of the things that I thought would be great about getting the four of us together too is that we're all married and we all have kids and we're all trying to navigate this crazy life and um, try to do it the best we can while having some fun, while making good decisions, um, while battling flesh versus spirit. I know that's a big one for, for me and for many dudes out there. Um, so we had a whole bunch of topics that we were going to talk about and I'm like, I'm going down the list in my head right now. And I, there's so many of them. I don't even know where to start, to be honest. Um, to be honest, there's hey, shout out, shout out, shout out to me <laughs> if I'm being honest. Um, but you know, I, I guess what about the fun aspect? Maybe we can start there. I'm just totally going random right now as I, um, continued to, uh, you know, I guess in my thirties, 
even 20s, like things change like throughout the years. Your kids get older, you find new things that you like or don't like, you start to learn more about yourself. I heard someone say the other day that uh, um, to a, a woman should should never marry a man before he's 40 because his head is still in his ass. <laughs> it's like pretty much, you know, it's only 40. Only 40. And, and, and I thought about it when he said that. And I was like, man, he's kind of right. Like, cause, and I, I, you know, I'm still doing dumb stuff daily, but like, or saying dumb stuff. And, um, this, this aspect, I guess what I'm getting at is this, this constant change. So how do you guys deal with change? Let's start there. Let's just talk about change in general, and then we'll just see where it goes from here. Because I know there's dudes out there going through change right now, and it could be on anything. We got to go to the grandpa. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> I'm not used to being the man of the sage at the table or the the, the man of wisdom. <laughs> no. Thanks for putting me on the spot. Yeah, you well, got it. Um, so when you talk about change, are you, you talking? Um, change that's that's sort of outside of our control the way life changes or are you talking about inner change as we're we're working on you know greater surrender to yeah to uh the spirit life or what i like both but i think and and i think they both maybe even tie in together yeah. and i think that my, my first thought on that is how fast everything is going mm -hmm. by how fast time is going by and how do we stop and live in the moment and be present with our families, with our kids, present with God, present with self too. And actually, um, actually learning a little bit about self instead of just, um, you know, kind of going through the motions of the day to day, which could be real easy if we're not staying plugged in to community. I mean, doing things like this, podcasting, talking about stuff, going to dinner, having a group, like whatever, yeah. whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a long winded answer, I guess I'm pretty terrible at that, but <laughs> well, um, you know, change obviously is, is a part of life and, and it's a good thing, you know, when you think about it, but I think, um, you know, in, in, the, in relation to recovery, um, and my own journey, um, and you guys can chime in or shoot me down on this or whatever, if you disagree, but I, I feel like, um, one of the, one of the reasons we sometimes find ourselves driven toward addictions and, and, and unhealthy attachments, um, in life is, is fear of change there. We, we look for ways to self-medicate because we, um, we wish things could be a certain way. However, we've idealized it in our minds. Um, we have regrets or pains from the past, um, that, you know, that we, we are trying to heal from in unhealthy ways. And, um, and then we also have those moments in our past as well that we're like, man, if life could just go back to being like that, you know, I'm, I'm realizing that even though I've been a really involved father and I think by God's grace, I've done a lot of things right. I've also, I'm also looking back at times that I squandered or things that I yeah. didn't do as well as I wish I could have. And, um, and it's easy to sort of just want to block that out somehow and, yeah. um, self-medicate in some way, you know, and to be able to be okay with my whole story and realize that I don't have to be um, Superman to be loved by God unconditionally and to be uh, the leader of my family that God's called me to be the co-leader with my wife and, and um, you know, to, yeah. to realize that I don't have to be a perfect dad for my kids to, to really yeah. someday look back and go, yeah, we know he wasn't perfect, but man, he loved us and um, he didn't always do it right. But Well, that's a huge change though, too, that you're going through yeah. being El Padre. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's I mean, that's now. huge. <laughs> El Padre. El Padre. That's great. You know, my, my daughter-in-law is, uh, is, is half Nicaraguan, half Puerto Rican. So El Padre oh, that's gonna perfectly. Work perfect, I, might, I might take that. El Padre. <laughs> yeah. It might be hard for your grandchild to say. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, no, that's good, man. Now, I think, um, I think to, to follow up with what you were saying is I always found myself unhappy with what what i had done the day before as a dad or as a husband and so trying to think of what i had to do the next day or the next week or the next month and so always planning ahead i was what i was going to do but always hating what i did that you know the days past and never thinking of but all i have to do today would be this yeah. it could be so simple right but i complicated I complicated every situation 
even if it was the simplest thing that I could be doing with, with my kids or something, I made it so complicated by thinking this has to be the moment. Right. And, and, and always being disappointed that it didn't live up to what I had built it up to be in my mind. And so constantly being unhappy with what just happened and unhappy with how am I supposed to do that in the future rather than focusing on right now. It sounds like a lot of unhappiness. Yeah. Like, constant like a cycle i guess huh yeah hmm. and i lived in it and then yeah. and and instead of trying to figure out how to process that that's you know where my addiction came into play it was you know what did i turn to instead of talking to somebody about it or or talking to my wife about what i wasn't happy about or you know what i wanted to do different with the kids or anything i just drank mm-hmm. you know yeah. cuz that just that was that was the easy way to deal with it you know and like you said that cycle would just continue do you feel that you've noticed a change in sobriety with that kind of cycle and pattern? Like, have you been kind of gotten a, a little bit off the hook on that, you know, oh, regrets? I mean, yeah, it's I, I, completely different now. Mm. You know, it's, first of all, I don't feel like I need to, I, I was trying to be my kid's God, mm. right? It's like, I was trying to be that perfect person, whatever that's supposed to be. Yeah. Right. Um, and I don't do that. I, I've realized that for my kids, all they want me to do is, is kind of be around. Yeah. You know, as long as I'm around and I'm hanging out yeah. with them, they, they, don't love care attention. What, they don't care what we're doing. Yeah. You know, it's like, instead of me having to do the extravagant thing and bring them to this amazing place and whatever, they just want to have a catch with me yeah. or talk to me or go for a run. My daughter likes to run with me, you know, like little things. Yeah. And that makes them completely happy. Yeah. You know, that their dad's just around. Or even just having your attention, right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, you know, something I feel guilty of is just being so consumed in all the things that are being a parent or being a leader in your home, like you mentioned, is uh, really trying to shut that stuff off and give the time to my kids. You know, I noticed with my son, like, it doesn't matter what he follows, whatever I'm into, you know, my interest in life, he follows just wanting to be like me. And uh, so I've definitely felt the conviction of, you know, I need to stop looking at this device so much and stop worrying about all the emails and just try to be present, you know? Yeah. So it's hard. It's hard though. At the same time, when um, you just feel so responsible for stuff and like, there's so much stuff to take care of. And like, I don't know if you guys are like me in this where like when I get behind on stuff, it gives me anxiety. Yeah. Like if I'm not out in front of it and I'm not like prepared I get, um, I just, I kind of lose it, you know? And so sometimes stopping even when I should is really difficult. You know what I mean? It's like, but at the end of the day, I'm never going to say if I was laying on my deathbed, like, man, I really wish I would have worked more. <laughs> like, no, nah, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids and with my yeah. family. And I wish I would have, you know, been more present probably in that moment. And that's a little trick that I use. And I think I've shared this on the podcast a few times, but it really does help. And I know this sounds morbid in a sense, but I, I remind myself often like shame, you're going to (laughs) die. Like you're going to die one day. It's inevitable. And it really does help to reset that mentality in my mind and make me very grateful. And, and like, like we were saying, Dan earlier, like, is it really that big of a deal? It's like, it never is usually. And that'll kind of help reset a lot of the times when I'm starting to go down that path because it can get squirrely. Yeah. And I, I realize that, you know, the, the whole, is it really that big of a deal? I mean, I take it really far now, but it's because I realize, you know, after living a life of stressing about every little thing all day long and none of it really had that much of a of an impact on the next day or the next week of my life. And, you know, I've realized that now. So just let anything roll off my back. Or like you said, you know, I don't let myself get stressed about, well, I didn't complete this today or I didn't get to this for work today or whatever. It's not a big deal. It'll still be there tomorrow. I'll, I'll get to it tomorrow. It's not going anywhere. And like Peter, like you were saying about your kids, like I, I remember in rehab, one of the things I saw about, how you should be with your kids is that, you know, your kids aren't going to listen to your words. They're going to follow your actions. That's right. right. And that, that's, right. that's how they're going to, to learn is by watching mm-hmm. what you do. And I really took that to heart. And I tried to think about that because I was, my actions were everything that was wrong. Mm-hmm. 
you know, before I got sober. It's like what I did yeah. on a daily basis and what I let my kids see, that's not what I wanted them to be. Yeah. You know, and so I, I constantly try to remind myself of that, of just how I'm behaving around the house or what I'm doing or or what kind of physical stuff, because I like I want my kids to be active. So yeah. see dad active as well. Like just anything like that, I think is going to make a difference for them, yeah. you know, rather than me telling them what to do. Right. And I think that's the beauty of, of having a, a someone in your corner, like your spouse to tell you, you know, I know for me, uh, I get so focused on wanting my children to grow up and be uh, amazing that I, you know, I look at everything as a teaching moment, you know, when they're misbehaving or whatever, it's like, I want to correct this, but, uh, my wife is good to remind me like, Hey, maybe you should say that differently, you know, and she's kind of in my corner saying, uh, maybe we should try this a different approach and stuff. And so I know I can get kind of caught up in the moment of trying to work through things or correct. And she's like, well, let's, you know, in the, in the backside, let's, let's try this a different way. So, you know, thank God for those outside influences that help us as men to uh, soften us and learn new ways. And <laughs> so how, how do we not get offended by that? I'm hoping Je Jess is upstairs. I'm hoping she's not listening right now. <laughs> she's so good at that too. And yeah. she's right nine times out of 10. And then as the stubborn dude, who's like, I'm like, and I get offended, you know, yeah. so not all the time, but sometimes like, oh, don't tell me what to do. Right. Don't, you, don't tell, And it's like, dude, really? Right. So I, I mean, I'm getting better, but dude, I'm like learning to work together can be tough, but it's, it's about the kids. It's not really about me. You know, I'm doing better in that aspect. Yeah. I'm an, I'm an advocate for fighting fair. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. we've kind of established for being together for 20 years that like, I probably need a minute just by myself where I can clear my thoughts yeah. and then let's talk about it. You know, mm -hmm. if you try to attack it right in the moment, like you didn't say that right. It's like, oh, we're fighting. Totally. <laughs> you know, All right, I got to go on a walk. Yeah. <laughs> but if I can get a few minutes to clear my head and, uh, you know, that's why I love right, riding a motorcycle. You can just take a ride and, well, you nice. know, clear it all out, uh, whatever your thing is. But, you know, that's kind of the rules that we've set up. So I, the fighting fair is like, okay, sh my wife knows that, like, I don't want to talk about it in the moment. So let's let it settle and then we'll take a break. It. And then I have to learn how to come back and then sometimes apologize, right? Cause I'm like, yeah. Oh, you're right. I didn't say that. Right. So yeah. uh, what about you guys? Uh, does your wives, uh, nag you and tell you that you <laughs> should have said it differently as well? <laughs> well, so I, I'm actually the guy that I'm usually the one that, um, wants to get at it right away. Like let's settle it. I don't, I don't want to wait another Like let's yeah. just handle it right now. And so I've had to, you know, in my relationship with my wife over the years, um, I've, I've had to learn to be able to be okay with, um, Hey, let's, let's let there be a cool down period. And, yeah. and, uh, and then, uh, she's been really good about understanding too, that we do need to deal with it. We can't just w sweep it under the rug because that's when stuff festers and turns rotten. So, oh, yeah. um, but yeah, it's definitely learning each other's temperament and how, how God's wired us and, uh, and, and honoring that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. We have a pretty good situation now now um you know in in how we talk about things and uh recognize each other's strengths and weaknesses um you know there are some things i'm better at with the kids handling with the kids something sure. she's definitely better at uh and we've we've grown to recognize those things and let each other take the lead at different times i think that's our biggest thing is when it's the other one's turn to take the lead um Prior to me getting sober, it was a horrible situation because I, like how you talk about sweeping things under the rug, that's all I, that's mm -hmm. all I did and avoided, you know, everything for me was about how quick can I end this conversation and get out of it, you know, rather than try to figure it out. Right. Yeah. Um, so we never solved any problem ever uh, when I was drinking, um, you know, now we don't solve everything, you know, yeah. and I do still try to find my way out of conversations <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> yeah. But for the most part, I think we've, you know, because I've calmed down and, and, and realized where it's better for her to be, you know, in the lead or whatever. I think we, we have a good, good relationship there and, uh, and how we handle the kids. Marriage is work. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of work, you know, parenting, all that. And that, that's like, if it was easy, everyone would do it and they do it great, I guess. Right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know, one of the um, things that I've become an advocate for in the last few years of our relationship is just, uh, partnering with counselors, people that we trust that will help us to 
get an outside perspective. I think a lot of times when there's frustration in our life, it's because we need some more perspective. Mm -hmm. And so we've really found a great joy in finding some counselors that we can work with. And so, you know, we do marriage tune ups or, or check ins and, and stuff like that. But um, just even in life, trying to ne ne navigate hard things like family or decisions and stuff, uh, just kind of finding comfort in going and, and getting an outside opinion or perspective that we, you know, respect and, and look up to yeah. has been super help, super helpful for us. So I, was, I wonder uh, how you guys feel about counseling and, you know, in some yeah. circles it's kind of taboo, but I feel like uh, I've become an advocate for it, but I was wondering what you guys felt about it. Yeah, definitely an advocate, um, but also had a, you know, a part of my journey where, um, and I don't know what you guys have experienced in your different various positions of leadership or whatever. I think um, in I love leadership, but I think one of the health, the unhealthy things about some leadership context, and unfortunately, it's it's common in the church, way too common, is that uh, you become the guru and and you you as a pastor or a leader or or whatever of an organization. It doesn't have to be just church, but you become the guy, and uh, and then you develop this sort of um, persona of needing to be needed or, or that, and, and then when you have to confront things in your own life, it's like really, really super hard and humbling to admit that, you know, I don't have it all together. I'm not the guru. Yeah. Um, and you know, whatever I have to offer anybody is purely by the grace of God, not, not because I'm Superman. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's, that's a good, great point. And I want to, I want to hear your take on that too, because I know that you dealt with just what Jeremy was talking about with work and your career, I think I remember you talking a bit about that, right? Just kind of having people look up to you, recognize you, dealing with all that, and then, you know, feeling empty almost at the same time. Yeah, well, I, I think that was part of, um, you know, my job was sort of a, a, a gift and a curse, right? My, I was able to continue building a life, um, and, and somewhat staying afloat because of my success. Uh, but my success also allowed, allowed my addiction to just keep driving forward mm. um, because it allowed for this level of entitlement to come into play. Um, but because of this success I built up in front of the camera and people knowing who I am, it, it forced me to put this mask on that I was afraid, terrified to take off and let anybody in. And that included my wife. Um, somewhere along the way, I blurred the lines between who who I really was as a person and who I was to, to the public. Mm. And I completely lost where that line was supposed to be drawn. Um, so I was, I was lost uh, in, in who I was. And so I kept the mask on 24 seven. So I didn't want anyone to come in. You know, you talk about a therapist, forget a therapist. How about a friend, Yeah, you know, or your wife or a family member? Or any, I didn't let anybody in. Yeah. Wow. You know, I was terrified to do that and I wasn't going to do it. Um, but, you know, I've learned the benefit of therapy and just the benefit of talking to yeah. people yeah. in general um, in this journey that I've been on. Uh, but when you talk about, you know, being an advocate for, for therapists, for couples therapy, that's a question I have because my wife and I have we have not been to therapy and we've talked about it because she and I have a ton of of healing to do right sure. I've, I've lied to her for the 16 years that we're together sure right so it's going to take years to to heal from that so we've talked about therapy but who do you go to who do you trust right how do you take that first step because I know what therapy has been like for me right and just like letting it all hang out, right. which has been huge. Like, I love that. But to do that with my wife in a, in a room is, is a whole nother animal. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. how do you, how do you take that step and trust the person that you're stepping into the room with to yeah. open up like that? I, I think for me, I, I've always been open. I don't, I don't like secrets and probably because of my upbringing, you know, and things that happen early on in life, it's like, secrets are kind of the enemy. And so I've always found comfort in, again, it goes back to someone I respect and trust, right? So I think that's the first step is finding that person that you can open up to. So, you know, with insurance and, and finding a counselor and things like that. I mean, 
in our world and Jeremy and I, it's, you know, we go through the church. We can start there. That's an easy on ramp. Um, but we've found some counselors through that. And then, you know, I, I think asking around, uh, getting, you know, other couples or, or who, people you can trust and say, Hey, who are you talking to? <clears throat> and then finding someone. And I think you've got to find the right counselor. You know, you might jump in and realize this is not my style. I don't like their approach. And so it's okay to kind of date it a little bit and find the right one. Uh, but when you do, um, there's something pretty special that happens when you, you've experienced the the freedom it brings. You said, mm -hmm. uh, when you can do that with your spouse and you're both, it's like a new level of, um, relationship that you haven't experienced yet. You know, it's a new level of intimacy in, between you. That is pretty special when you can, uh, work on your stuff together, that togetherness piece. So that's why I think I'm an advocate for it. Cause it, it's like a new layer of relationship. And now that you're in health, uh, being able with your wife to come and say, Hey, we want to fine tune these things or past hurts. Uh, it, it kind of unfolds a new layer of relationship that you have. It's like another gear in your relationship that you haven't kicked into yet. So I think from my experience, that's what I would say that as an advocate, I would say it's yeah. worth it. It's, yeah. it's hard. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be really, you know, able to say, I'm sorry, which is uncomfortable. And I'm, kind I'm of, pretty used to it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so good at it now. <laughs> I'm pretty good at it. Uh, that's like, um, you know, when, when dealing with some of the stuff like, like Dan, like your past, my past, some of those things, um, we get a lot of the help in counseling, in, um, you know, therapy, rehab groups, 12 step for, for a lot of folks out there. I know that was a big part, especially early on for me. Um, and, our spouses don't get a lot of that a lot of the time. The true. spouses get overlooked true. for so much and because so much of the tension is on us and, oh, you know, this and that. And, and then, and, and I know that Jess and I have had to work through some things where she started to become resentful. So I, you know, I got better and then I started a podcast and then I did this and I, and then it was like, well, what about me? Like I was the one full holding down the fort when your butt was right being a dummy, you know, yeah. again, and you had to go to rehab and like, and so, and she got some of the group therapy when, um, when, uh, she came to visit and stuff like early on, but we, we've seen multiple therapists and to answer your question about how to find one for us, it's been, um, just, tr just throwing the pole in the water almost, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think the church, though, is a great place to start too. If, if you have a good church in your area, because there, that's a great community to, to start with too, and meets people, whatever. But, um, I, what we're doing right now is not normal, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want to make that very clear right. for most, for, I don't know how, I, I wish I had a, a percentage cause I'm like, what's the percentage of that? But dudes, normally don't sit around and talk about feelings like we're doing right now. Yeah. It's not, it's not common. It's right. really not. Um, I talked to so many dudes who just go, wait, wait what you, you talk about stuff. And it's like, yeah, we do. And it's, so it is a little uncomfortable at first. The more yeah. you do it, the more you're in therapy, the more you're in counseling, the more you're in groups, community, um, whatever it is, it gets better and you learn and you grow. But the therapy for Jess and I has been, we're, we just had a meeting with our financial counselor today because we butt heads on money and we've made some bad decisions in the past. And, you know, and I, I don't, I don't want those to happen again. So it's like, how do we work together? Well, Hey, we need a third party to come in and actually help us with a budget, help us with retirement, help with, with all that stuff. And I only was willing to do that because that's a touchy subject because of the history and the experience of doing it in like about our marriage and other stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I do dive in, bro. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy, but I think it was Warren Buffett who said, everybody needs a coach. Totally. Everybody needs a coach. Yeah. And I found that uh, I had some stuff kind of come up this last year from family stuff, deep stuff. And so I had to go see a counselor because I didn't know, how, I didn't even know how to respond to it. I didn't know how to process it. So that was tremendously helpful. But I found that it gave me more grace to be a better husband and parent when I worked on that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think the, what you're saying, even on your journey of sobriety, uh, you know, you, again, you get in health and it gives you more uh, grace to do the things that are in front of you, which the blessings that you've been given. And so 
you know, when I'm in better health, I parent better. And so yeah. uh, that was a real eye opener this last year that like, I thought I was doing okay. But when I started to work on myself, I actually got a little bit better at uh, having grace and, and love of my kids better. So again, advocate and uh, I'm with Shane, like you just got to jump in and if it's not right, then just keep trying. Yeah. So it's good. Not everyone's going to be a good fit, you know? Yeah. No, but admittedly, I have to say like, I, you can't lose. You right? can't, it's like, you can't, no. <laughs> even, even a, a, a session that, you know, okay, I don't love the counselor or yeah. whatever it may be. I mean, you have nothing to lose yeah. from it. Yeah. You know? It's the, it's the same reason I always tell people that it, addicts, you know, just go to a meeting, whatever, yeah. you know, you can't lose from the meeting. If you hate it and you walk out, so be it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but you never know. You yeah. might get something from it. You, yeah, exactly. And you can't use while you're at the meeting. So it, it, at least it <laughs> at was least a day. Just that, drink a, right? a, a, a ton of coffee and there may be like a carton of cigarettes being smoked out on the back patio. Yeah. But hey, no one's doing drugs or drinking alcohol. So we're good. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. You might just learn what you don't like. You know, you might learn that. No, that's not for me. Yeah. That, that's education too. You're learning. Totally. Hey, I'm going to change gears here for us a little bit. Go for because it. Because you guys are mentioning um, church a lot. You're mentioning God a lot. Um, you know, for, for myself, I grew up uh, in a Catholic family. We went to church every Sunday, you know, the whole bit. Um, but admittedly, the moment I was able to make the decision for myself, I never went to church. That was the end yeah. of that. I didn't like all the rules and I just didn't enjoy the experience. Um, so I, I got out of it as soon as I could. Um, during the pandemic, when I was really in a bad way, I really felt myself searching for something and I didn't know what I was searching for. I do know that um, I started reaching out to my oldest brother a ton mm -hmm. at that time who has him and his family have a wonderful relationship with God. I don't even know what I was asking him or why I was asking him, but I was, I was desperate for something. Right. Yeah. Um, and things changed for me quite a bit when I did go to rehab. Um, I felt different. Um, but the reason I'm bringing this up is we, you know, in, in, um, the 12 step program, and I know a lot of people, um, you know, that I talk to who uh, are struggling with trying to find sobriety or trying to find help. There's that whole higher power thing. Yeah. Um, some people give into it. Some people don't give into it. Um, you know, search for something else. Right. Um, you know, and I just wondering from, from your perspective, um, you know, how you guys feel about people's journey and trying to find that something, you know, cause I was, as I said, lost and searching. I didn't even know what I was searching for. Um, and I have found it, but, I, but I'll admit I'm still trying to figure it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not answering this. That's no. on YouTube. I just <laughs> want to say that's probably one of the best questions that I've heard in a long time. And I'm so glad that you asked it, bro, because man, even that's vulnerable throwing it out there. So like Shane Holy said, God. it's not normal, right? It's not. <laughs> <laughs> and and we were kind of having this conversation yesterday. I was telling him about some other uh, people. I was watching their podcasts online. And uh, I think that's the amazing part of the God that I believe in. And uh, the, the God that I have lived my life to follow is that I think that uh, he has the ability to reach us wherever we're at. And, you know, there's not like a kind of cookie cutter way that, that God kind of connects with us. I know for me, I really met God when I was, uh, going through, I had been diagnosed with heart disease and I was mad at God. I mean, I turned my back on God and I was just like, why, why me? And I was upset. And, uh, that's when I really connected with God was through my anger towards, uh, that diagnosis. And that happened when I was a teenager. And so, uh, you know, but I talked to different people and, and seeing that God will find you in your life where you're at. And I think that God in his grandeur is, is, uh, able to know our life and know what we're facing. And he meets us uh, at different parts of our journey. And I think that, you know, you coming to that place in sobriety and in all that was 2020, you know, 
the world was, yeah, was madness, <laughs> seemingly, you know, imploding. Uh, you know, God knew that that was coming and he uh, started to have a conversation or, or those thoughts kind of started coming up for you. And so I think that's the cool part about God that I think is, is so special is that each of us, it looks different, but he kind of comes and meets us at certain points. I don't know how you feel, Pastor Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with everything you said. And I guess for me, I grew up in a home that was, um, that was very uh, uh, high charge Christianity. You know, it was, it was a, a charismatic sort of a Pentecostal upbringing. Um, a lot of things from my childhood expression of faith, I, I still love and, and appreciate. Uh, but there was a, there was this religious fervor that was like there in certain ways, but it was a very hypocritical experience where I, I came to this place where, you know, my parents were so charged up about God when they were at church or with, with their religious friends or whatever. But then, you know, we'd fight all the way home and, and <laughs> nothing seemed good in my, in, in behind the scenes. Right. And so, yeah. um, so I really grew up with that kind of, you know, they had come out to not throwing them under the bus. I love my parents, but they, they, they came out both of, from a long line of, they didn't have any real sound spiritual heritage. And so they came out of addiction and abuse and things like that. And so they were, when they found Christ, they were just trying to do the best they could with what they knew. And so we were kind of in the crosshairs of that whole change going on in their lives. And so, so I had to really come to a place of, you know, who, who is God? And, and if he exists, does he love me? And what's he like? And how's he feel about me? And, um, and I, I kind of went on this search in my teenage years, believe it or not, where I, I just, I knew that I had to get to the bottom of, of some things for myself if I was going to experience any peace on this level. And I started to just study other religions and I started, um, studying different claims and, and I just came to this, this appreciation for, for Jesus and, um, it, as, as being trustworthy and reliable in, in who he claimed to be. And so my belief system is based on, on this Jesus who I believe revealed himself to me at a, at a young age. Uh, when I was in the lowest, I was experiencing suicidal ideation. Um, on the one hand, I was athletic and popular and had friends and, but, but they didn't know what I was struggling with. In fact, I was just at a, my 30th high school reunion, if you can believe that. <laughs> Good grief. And, uh, I, and you know, we were talking with some old friends and, and they're like, man, you just seem so, and I was kind of opening up to some oh, of them, wow. you know, and as we were talking about life and some of them have gone through some hard things and a few of them were saying, man, you just seemed like you were always the cut up and the, the, you know, funny and everything. And I'm like, yeah, that's like, that's true of most comedians. I think, you know, they, they're hiding a lot of pain, yeah. you know, <laughs> through their comedy. Yeah. And, uh, so that's kind of, you know, but, but God, I, again, he just met me like Peter said, he met me where I was at. And, um, he, when it wasn't until I believed in a God, I came to know a God through Christ who loved me exactly as I was and not as I should be that I, that when I finally encountered that experience of God, um, that he wasn't trying to tell me I had to change in order for him to love me, but that he loved me exactly as I was. But then at the same time, loved me too much to leave me in my mess. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that was how it all kind of came together for me. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is the way Jesus seems to go. It's interesting that you read the gospels and really the only people Jesus locks horns with is, are, are the religious people, the Pharisees and yeah. the self-righteous and the people that think they have it all together. Right. Yeah. The, the prostitutes and the, the alcoholics and the, the tax collectors and those that were socially unredeemable and the lepers, they, they flocked to Jesus. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, so it was kind of, it's just been this phenomenon to me to think about in a lot of churches today, um, the very people that were repulsed by Jesus are the kinds of people that typically fill a lot of churches today. And the people that love Jesus the most are the kinds of people that are scared to death of church. And so I just, my own desire is that church would somehow become that place that becomes the safest place uh, in the, in the world for people to for, for, for the, for a fallen world to fall and, yeah. and feel safe and, and feel like there's someone there to catch them. And I'll say that both of our churches have, you guys have a celebrate recovery now too, yeah. right? And so that's a, have you heard of celebrate recovery? No, it's a program that we have in our church and it's, it's all about helping people uh, walk through the process of habits and hangups and hurts. And so it can be things um, that are emotional. It can be substance. It can be whatever. And so, 
um, you know, we both support that wholeheartedly and yeah. seeing people get free. And, um, and so, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I, I want to make a place where you can come in and, and be broken and find health and love and acceptance. And then, you know, God will work on that stuff with you. Mm -hmm. So, and people who are, feel like they're experiencing something, people who are, you know, maybe coming out of addiction in early sobriety, um, you know, who maybe aren't comfortable going to church or, you know, what, what can they do um, mm. when they're trying to figure out this thing? What kind of, for lack of a better term, exercises or sure. activities can they do to help them steadily start to find a bit of a way? Yeah, I, I always am a big advocate for relationships yeah. and uh, Celebrate Recovery is a great place for people to jump in and experience our church, but not experience our church, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's like they're not coming into a Sunday service where it can feel different. And and uh, we do our best on Sunday. I think Jeremy would say the same thing. We do our best to be as welcoming as possible. You know, we try to do all that we can to think about that new person every time. That's, that's our goal. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know... Um, so I, you know, I think a lot of people find their way into the church through things like that. Maybe it's a small group. It's where they, you know, get to go to a friend's house and, and, uh, and just hang out uh, or celebrate recovery or, or whatever it is. And so I think those relationship pieces make even yeah. that bridge to church a lot easier. A lot, a lot of times. I, I think like groups, um, you mentioned groups and then I think about Ian's group out the bonfire group, you yeah. know, like there's how many dudes go out there 15 to 30 yeah. on any given yeah. time or whatever. Um, and it's just a group of dudes hanging out. Some are smoking cigars, <laughs> so bonfire, like just talking and we're in fellowship, you know what I mean? And just being, um, and, and relating to each other about stuff too. To me, we're having church right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, right. I, I truly believe that. Like th that's what, it's not a building. It's right. not, it's, um, it's doing what we're doing right now. And I, I don't understand it. <laughs> I'm no Bible scholar like at all. Yeah. Um, but I know that I know there's something alive in here. I know it's completely separate from this. Um, and I too, by the way, I can't remember if we talked about this on either podcast, but I was raised Catholic also. Mm -hmm. So I did catechism. Mm -hmm. I felt really guilty um, when I stopped going to Catholic church because my grand, it was in our family, you know, and we were real Catholics. We went to church on Easter, on Christmas. <laughs> What's we the name? For watched some? the Notre Dame games as Jim Gaffigan would say. Yep. <laughs> yes. No, hey, I'm not hating on the Catholics. I love y'all out there. Awesome. I'm not trying to be a jerk or anything, but <laughs> it was like, that's what I knew, you know, and it was very religious and I didn't understand. I had no concept other than the fact that I knew, I knew who Jesus was and I knew I loved him and I, I felt love from God even when I was a kid, but I had no concept of like this relationship with God. I thought I had to go to a priest or to, to, in order to get that. And that just wasn't true. And so for me, the day before I went to rehab, I was actually just, we lived just close to where we're at right now, just a, a couple blocks over. And I was supposed to leave that next day. I hadn't been to church in, I don't know how many years or really thought about going to church or anything. And um, I was all messed up in my head saying like, you know, oh man, the cat's out of the bag. Like Jess knows I have a problem. Like now I got to go to rehab. And then I was all about it that night. And then the next morning when I woke up, that thing upstairs started going, you don't need help. Mm. Don't be a, yeah. don't be a punk. You know, don't you, you got this, you're good. And I was like, man, I got to go on a walk. So I go on this walk and I find the Bible in the middle of the road laying open there. I walk right past it and I hear something go, go pick it up. Wow. And I turn around, I go pick it up. I don't remember what it says. I wish I did. But it was just something said, you're doing the right thing, go. That's like all I heard at that time. Wow. And so I immediately stopped and turned around and I went home and I started packing my bag and I was like, and I haven't looked back on the sobriety tip since. But what I want to say as a caveat to that is that was almost 10 years ago. 
And for those 10 years, even though I had that moment with God in that moment, man, this walk has been really tough sometimes because I have so much doubt and question. And is it real? Um, what is it? Um, one foot in, one foot out, you know, and um, it's been a it's been a battle between back to that flesh and spirit thing that I just don't understand. And my man brain tries so hard to understand and have the answers for it. And I don't know. But at the end of the day, I do know that there's like this everlasting love that God has for me, for my family. And when I'm in that and being of service, like everything feels okay. <laughs> and that's it. You know what I mean? And and now I'm in this new part where I'm, st- I'm like, I'm hungry for it. And I'm starting to read way more and I'm starting to pray more. And I don't know, it's just doing some crazy stuff, but it's literally taken almost 10 years and, and I'm just, I feel like I'm just like starting out in some senses, you know, it's crazy. Um, but the religious stuff for me, um, not a fan, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not a fan. <laughs> I'll just end with that. I guess on that. For As sure. a pastor, I would say me either. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Man. Yeah. Well, that's why I love you guys. <laughs> yeah. When I think it goes back to what I said earlier about how God really meets you where you're at. And it, so, man, you, he, know. you know, him laying that Bible on the road for you to see and then him graciously walking with you for the past 10 years, which congratulations. I mean, that's something to celebrate. Yeah. Thanks man. Uh, you know, that journey, it it is a journey. It's not a, it's not a momentary uh, revelation. I think maybe some people it it works like that, but again, God meets you where you're at. And so some of us, I mean, to get back to marriage, it's like your, your wedding day is the start, not the be all end all, you know? And so, you just, you're barely t- stepping your toe in the water, you know, on your wedding day is yeah. wonderful as that is. Then, then, then this relationship start. I didn't mean to cut you no, off, Peter, but that's, that's exactly that's, right. You know, just that relationship begins. And then I look at my relationship with God, very similar to, there's a lot of parallels to marriage. And even the Bible uses that illustration of God as Jesus, as the bridegroom and, and mm-hmm. his church as the bride. And I think one of the comparisons there is that, you know, 99% of my relationship with April is, is just everyday life together, right? Where it's yeah. not planned. It's not, it's, it's, uh, it's just taking life as it comes. It's, it's learning to love each other in the tough moments and, and learning to respond to things in a way that honors each other. And it takes time and it takes practice and it, and it takes forgiveness and, and a lot of grace. And, and now I'm in this relationship with God and he's perfect on his end, but I'm still not. And, um, and so I have to really remember though, like you'd, you'd mentioned, like for people that aren't into quote, quote unquote, going to church or whatever, the way I look at it for me, and this has just been helpful for me is that I don't need to go to church to have a relationship with God to, um, but, but kind of like with my marriage, 90% of it spent in the day to day, the unplanned, the routines, right? But my wife and I, if we're going to have a healthy marriage, we plan date night. We plan coffee together. We plan the conversation to sit down around finances together. And so I look at church and, you know, that experience of, Hey, I'm going to, this is kind of like date night with God or, or, you know what I mean? Where I'm going to, I'm going to focus for the next hour, really in a special way. I'm going to get together with his bride beyond myself and, and just sort of realize how big God is in relation to his people. And, and so I look at it that way. It's not that I have to have date night with my wife to be married to her that happened on the wedding day but (laughs) it sure is good for the relationship you know (laughs) yeah so it's a good analogy too like bringing that into the day-to-day yeah is what you're saying right i mean yeah Hmm. it's 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 the same thing as recovery right it's Mm -hmm. like yeah it depending on what your approach to it is but i live recovery all day every day now it's kind of built into almost every conversation i have and i've I've built it into my work as well. I, I try to stay surrounded by it, but you still have to make time to go to a meeting. Right. Sometimes, yeah. you yeah. know, uh, do oh, yeah. something, you know, specifically for it. Right. Um, Isn't it funny too, how when you bring that up, how many people like I could be standing randomly at a grocery store or where, who knows where that's happened so many times and you get to talk in, and then, and then someone, their brother struggling or their, yeah. their mom, or, I mean, it's almost, it's almost like every single person has gone through something. You know, we all have a story, I guess what I'm yeah. getting at too. Yeah. 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 
And that was the best part about opening up about it in the first place is the amount of people I've connected to since, since, you know, admitting my problem and, and telling it to anybody who listens, the amount of people that have opened up back to me and told me, just like you said, that's awesome. about their sister or their friend yeah. or, you know, somebody, you know, and it's, it's just a whole nother level of connection to. Right. Yeah. Anybody. yeah someone who's living secretly and they're not, they're not living in that vulnerable place like you are now they're not safe right and and the more vulnerable we are the more transparent we are uh, the more honest we are the the more approachable we are and you know it's just yeah. i mean i've even noticed that in in ministry where there tends to be sometimes unfortunately a culture where people you know raise you up to a, a level of like you're the guy on the stage and you're the guy that preaches the bible and you're the guy that has answers and you do counseling and you you know whatever <laughs> and it's like, man, I, I, that will drive me nuts if I allow myself to live in that persona. Like I, I have to be, I, I have to lead from among, not from above. So how, you know how, I mean? how do you like, separate yourself yeah. from that? Because that's got to be a difficult thing to do and yeah. not get caught. Because there, there, there could be ego involved in that, right? Oh, there mean, totally is. Pride. Yeah. I mean, all the things yeah. that we go down the list, especially as dudes, like how do you separate that? Yeah, Jeremy. How do you separate that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on it. Um, you do great, by the way. That's not what I was just for the yeah, record. Thanks. But I'm just, I mean. I mean, you've gosh, seen me drop a couple of words on the golf course. Oh, man, you know? dude. We have so much fun <laughs> playing golf. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, part of it for me was, um, is, is and, and it has been, I've got a, a, a friendship circle that my wife and I do of other couples that, that, over the years, God has kind of pieced together. I say God has pieced together. I mean, we've we've sought it, but yeah. but I believe God's orchestrated it ultimately. And um, you know, to to be to do life on life with other couples who I've needed this. Now, this I'm just speaking to my situation, but as a pastor, I need a group of people in my life who can still receive from me as their pastor, but don't need me to be on twenty four seven. That Dude. that. You know, they, yeah. they, they just know me first as Jeremy, not Pastor Jeremy. And yeah. that's been huge for me that God's put these people in my life that love me enough to tell me the truth when I'm acting like a jackass or um, that love me enough to uh, just love me where I'm at and not get surprised when they see me fail in front of them, whether it's in a, you know, something I say snarky to my wife yeah. or, or some flying off the or, handle or, or a my slice kid or, into the or trees. A slice into the trees. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, man, I, yeah. um, that's been a huge gift from God for me. And, and I think, um, also, you know, I don't, I never want to turn the sermon time into like a, a, a therapy sofa for me, you know, it's not, that's not what it, the point is, but there are ways too, that I've just tried to bring people into my life in a, in a, in an appropriately transparent way. You know, again, it's not there different levels of different trust levels, you know, are important and you don't just get up and bear everything to the wrong people or whatever. That's yeah. not what I'm saying. But people need to know, and I think over time appreciate knowing that uh, their pastor or whoever it is in their life that they're looking to for leadership um, is uh, lives in the real world and kicks the dog sometimes and um, has, right. you know, uh, uh, just just is real. And yeah. so authentic yeah. and yeah. yeah. And I don't know, so, you know, I don't always, I don't always know. I mean, you're, you're gracious as a friend to, to encourage me in that and tell me, Hey man, thanks. Thanks for who you are and how you come across and that totally. kind of thing, which is, I was just after church on Sunday talking with a guy and, and he said, Hey, I bumped into uh, someone at the gym who said, he actually goes to your church, Peter, but he said, Hey man, I love pastor Jeremy. He's, you know, it's cool. You're going there. Yeah. Um, he, man, that guy's the same wherever I see him in town. He's the same <laughs> on the stage. And yeah. I've never, you know, I don't get that kind of object. Like people don't just yeah. walk up to me and tell me that. So to hear yeah. that second hand that this, that yeah. was like, yeah. and yeah. I was kind of in a funk that day too, you know? And so it was like, That's God awesome. was just speaking to me through him going, a little encouragement. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You knucklehead, you, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, good man yeah i think for me it's like it, it kind of as a leader uh it's the integrous part of being a leader yeah. is that being the same yeah i don't i don't ever want to be the guy who's different on stage than i am at home yeah. that's yeah. like toxic and dangerous and and i uh, i don't want my kids to live under that you yeah, know and the sure. family and so um you know i i try to live my life where um you know i i practice what i preach and you know, I want my kids to be able to do what I do. And so it kind of is a, a good regulator for my life, but 
I think as a, as a pastor too, I, I seek people who will tell me the truth. Mm-hmm. I seek those people who will say what needs to be said. Cause you know, it's like you speak a sermon and everybody's like, great job. Yeah. You know? And I'm like, no, I want the guy who's going to say, Hey, that was great, but here's what you need to work on, yeah. you know, to help me grow. Sure. You know, and then your wife is faithful to be like, Hey, your, your zipper was down the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Why do you keep walking to the right? And, you know, whatever. Yeah. Can we have a little code for that? Like a yeah. nose rub or something? <laughs> yeah. My flies down. Come on. What's going on? So I uh, seek those people <clears throat> to help me and, and they'll tell me the truth yeah. and, and are willing to give me feedback that helps me grow. I, uh, and I, I love, but I mean, cause I just keep hearing the word authenticity. I think I said it before too. Um, and I think from feedback I've heard just from sober guy podcast, that's one of the most, that's one of the most often things I hear from people who've listened yeah. to the podcast is like, man, it's just, I love it because it's just real. You have good guests. It's just real conversations. It's not trying to be anything that it's not. Yeah. It just is. And I think that there's, um, especially in like the social media world we live in today and the, and just media in general and television and internet and we're bombarded by all this stuff that's competitive and tells you you're not good enough because you're not doing it this way. So there's a lack of authenticity. I feel like we're in a lot of, um, um, in people maybe, you know, so it's, it creates question. It creates doubt. Um, so you have to have like that core group or those core people around you to encourage you, build you up. And like you said, I love that. Like, tell you like, Hey, quit being a jackass. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, and I want that. I don't, I don't need yes men around me. All is I'm never going to get better. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think it's about, I love what you said about, you want to be the same guy at home, you mm-hmm. know, that you are at work. Like it, they should see the real you. Yeah. Um, you know, and how do you feel like you guys, you know, with your, with your kids, you know, you do a podcast, a parenting podcast, yeah. you know, do you try to be on your kids level or do you try to get your kids to rise to your level or where, where do you try to meet your kids? Yeah. I, and I think that it kind of morphs as you walk with them through their development. You know, when I, when the kids were younger, um, and my son's still kind of in that age as a, as a 10 year old, they just are fine. Just, you know, Hey, this is what we're going to do as a family. And I want to do that with mom and dad and I'll do whatever they say. And my son just wants to be a me and that's super cool. And, uh, my daughter, you know, has a special relationship with, with my wife and it's just the way God connected is pretty amazing. As they're getting older into the teenage years, they start to morph. And I feel like, you know, something that I always tell our leaders is that, uh, if you want kids to listen, you got to speak their language. And so as our relationship changes, it goes from, you know, a relationship where I can say, Hey, you need to do this. And they do it to, uh, it's more relational based. Um, it morphs. And so I am really trying to be the dad now for my daughter who doesn't freak out when things come my way, you know, be level headed and be chill. And, and, uh, and so we've really worked on our relationship and for my son, you know, trying to, um, just give him what he needs and support him and, and build up his self-esteem. And so I feel like our relationship changes as they change. And so it's not kind of like just a, you know, uh, that kind of answer, but yeah, that's what I've, I'm kind of experienced. And you've raised teenagers that are now adults and married. So you're kind of farther on that journey. How would you answer that? Jeremy? <laughs> El Padre. Yeah. Poppy. <laughs> well, I'm certainly looking forward to the grandkid, uh, to try to get a second shot at certain things, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Um, you know, I have, I think p- one of the things that I might do a little bit differently, um, looking back on, on how I've raised my kids is that, um, you know, I was raised very poor. My, um, my dad had a good job when I was really young and then we moved, uh, to Northern California from Southern Cal and things just didn't go well from that point forward for about a 10 year span in our life. We were just really, when I say poor, I mean, I I won't get into it here, but pretty destitute. And, um, so, uh, I wanted to give my kids things that I didn't have, um, which I think is, there's nothing necessarily completely wrong or diabolical with that. But I think there were things that I was afraid to be a little bit more, 
uh, restrictive on or, or disciplinary in. And it's not that I didn't have times where I had to come down hard on them. I was, you know, known more as the wait till your father gets home on those occasions, you know, <laughs> the, my wife still would make yeah. that threat. So they did have that sort of, uh, oh, dad, you know, in, in under certain circumstances, but by and large, you know, I really, I, um, I feel like maybe there were certain areas where I, I wouldn't have been as strict, but then there's other areas where I think I would have focused more on, but they were areas of deficit in my own life, uh, that things that I didn't have or whatever. And so I kind of spoiled them a little bit. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I tended to try to see things that I felt like my dad could have done better. And so I really wanted to compensate for that on the other side. And I, you know, you just learn as you go and, and you don't, they don't come with a manual, you know? Um, and so it's, uh, you know, but yeah, I, I so I, I don't know if that answers the question other than I, there were, I guess there were areas where I really tried to call my kids up to my, my level in terms of, I, I believe I'm a responsible guy. I, I learned through the school of pain and hard knocks, how to, be responsible, how to be a planner, how to, you know, be a scheduler yeah. and that kind of thing. And, and, um, so when I see my kids floundering and playing too many video games or whatever, I'm like, guys, grow the, <laughs> know. you know, grow yeah. up and, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you know, that kind of a thing. But, uh, yeah, I, but there were other times where I think I probably could have, uh, raised the bar a little bit and they got a little bit too comfortable. And, and now we're having to kind of talk through some of those things as, as a, you know, as adults, they're great boys. I mean, they're awesome. Yeah. You know, I, they're, they've got, I, I have no complaints in terms of, I have so much to be thankful for. Totally. Um, but uh, yeah, you just go and you evaluate the stuff you did and didn't do as a dad. And there were times on my, my oldest son, especially when, I mean, that's your first kid and you're, you're experimenting. It's like the lab rat, right? right? And so <laughs> they get all the, they get some benefits, but they also get some challenges. They get all your mistakes the first time. And, you know, yeah. so my son who's 23 and I, we've had to have some meaningful conversations about that where I've just had to come to him and say, man. I really blew it on that one. I'm sorry because he'll look at his younger brother and he's like, "He gets away with murder." You know what? <laughs> what are you talking about? And, yeah. uh, so anyway, huh. yeah. I was the youngest yeah. of five, and I got away. Okay. I got away with murder. Okay. I did. Yeah, the youngest does, huh? Yeah, it's my like, parents yeah. were tired by then. Yeah. You know, they'd had it. They were like, "Just <laughs> that's not a hill don't get a, on. Don't yeah. get arrested." That's basically what it was. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, that's I, 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 I have a question actually for everybody though. You know, when it comes to our kids. You're, you're, you brought up social media and everything, all the kids that are, all the things that our kids are exposed to yeah. now on a daily basis. What, what the line, there's no, like, there's no exact answer to this, but that line of where you push them to strive, to dream, to be good, good or great at something. And I think it's it's almost impossible for kids not to have some level of being materialistic because of everything they see mm -hmm. nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know where where is that line of how much is okay? How much do you push them? But how do you keep them from that being the be all end all at yeah. the same time? Because they they I know my kids the some of the crap they see on youtube and everything you know with oh, yeah. these and they feed with these kids who are only 18 or 19 years old yeah. who they see they think those kids have the world because of the house and the cars and the clothes and, yeah you know and i don't want them to think that they can't want that because they can to an extent you know but that that's not well, that, yeah, right. That, that doesn't make you. I, t I tell the kids, uh, especially Lucy, and the hard thing too is they see dad, you know, doing podcasts, and I'm, you know, in post production working on a video for work or whatever. And I've noticed as they've get they've continued to get older, I didn't, I never told them, hey, do videos or do music or whatever. They've watched. It's, someone mentioned it earlier. They've watched me do that, mm -hmm. and now they do it. And so it's like, it's cool. Part of me is like, oh, that's awesome, dude. You like, And Lucy's really good at like editing videos and she's 12 and she's really good at it. And so part of me is like, that's awesome. And then the other part of me is like, you're on that way too much. Yeah. <laughs> so where do we draw the line? Like, and mm -hmm. Jess and I, um, we just started a new one as they went back to school. Like their, their um, iPads and phones are from three to 6.30. If they're done and not, not that whole time, but that's the certain block that they can get it. And then at the end of the day, they, they turn it in and we're done for the night. And then we, I think we said Sundays, we nothing on Sundays where it's family day, we're hanging out. Um, but the one thing, you know, with that too, that I've noticed is um, 
let's say views, for instance. Oh, my, my video, it got a thousand views. Yeah. And that's awesome. But I want, my, I want my kids to know that views or whatever it is that likes or um, ad, ad, admiration for this or that, that doesn't complete you. That doesn't yeah, make you totally. feel whole. That doesn't put value into your life. You're trying to stuff, at, well, not them, but you could be, which I've experienced personally, <laughs> trying to stuff so many things into this um, box or into this soul to fulfill it that only God can fulfill, period. And nothing has ever worked to fulfill it at all because I've tried everything, <laughs> you know? And so I see them already in, in um, doing that in some aspects, like, oh, I got this many likes. And I think, it, I, I actually, I shouldn't say that. I think it's pretty innocent right now still, but I could see how as you grow or as you get, and adults do the same stuff too. Oh, yeah, like yeah. I'm guilty of it too, the scrolling. Well, why do why why don't I have that or whatever you know right. go down the list of things why why can't I go on that vacation or whatever um, it really does do something if you're not conscious of it and so I'm pretty I think I feel like Jess and I are aware of it but it's impossible to 100 percent regulate like it, I'm, yeah, I've come sure. to the conclusion of that in the day and age we live and then I find myself sounding like some old fart already like <laughs> back in my day we were outside <laughs> yeah. playing and we were jumps and yeah, we were exactly. going down to the park and I mean but it's true yeah but like it's yeah. just different now and so I think there's some acceptance in that 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 yeah. Jess and I are working with and at the same time same time trying to have boundaries and stuff too I, I feel like you know it's it's uh, your, your guys both your platforms for your show is about sobriety right mm -hmm. You know, I think we are still yet to discover the depths of uh, young people's addiction to technology. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Uh, as it continues to evolve, you know, now they're messing with AI and stuff and technology is growing every day. And uh, so there's no there's no chance that our kids are not going to not have technology a, a part of their life like it was for us. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I feel like, you know, my job as a parent now, I feel like really, you know, my daughter just started her first YouTube channel. And uh, so we're working with our kids on how to live a life that's not, you know, to not become an addict. Mm -hmm. And so I think about the sobriety things that you guys have walked through and the things that you've learned. Those are things that I think I would be healthy to apply to technology because it's like you're going to yeah. grow up your whole life with it. It's going to continue to evolve into something that we have yet to see. And so they can't avoid it. It's not like I can put our kids in a bubble, but teaching them skill sets to not become addicted, I think is what we're trying to focus on. Yeah. You know, uh, to me, technology is a tool and it's, it's good in its intention, but it becomes quickly a bad thing. Right. And so, you know, the, the boundaries are healthy, you know, and, and all the things that come, there's so many negatives that come with it. Like you just mentioned the likes and the yeah, yeah affirmation. Well, it seems like it's more addictive than like heroin. Exactly. Like, yeah. I, I would almost argue that point like right now and say like technology, screen time, iPads. And I'm talking about for kids or adults. It literally seems like it's a heroin oh, totally. style. See, look oh. at Ty. See, I mean, I how mean, many right? of us like, have been five yeah. minutes down the road and you What's realize. What's your take, Ty? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just, no, you know, you're five minutes down the road and realize you you forgot your phone and it's like you panic. Oh yeah. And, and you're <laughs> like, oh my god. And you race home and you're like, you know, it's crazy. I yeah. mean, yeah. we used to go all day without having any means other than to pull over at a phone booth or, or whatever in, in contact. Just page them, me, you know? bro. Just right. page me. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it ha is. Have you done that crazy. though, where you didn't go back ever? Because I know I've done it a couple. I've done it way more. Came back to get it, but there has been times that I'm like, you know what? It. Yeah, I'm not going no, to get it. And I you honestly feel so don't remember. free. <laughs> I got to try that sometime. I don't, I don't remember ever a time not going yeah. back to get it, you know? And it's I, and my justification is, well, I got a lot of work related totally. stuff on it. I got it. You know, I'm going to miss a lot or whatever. What if there's an emergency? But, yeah, right. So, <laughs> I mean, like I don't have a phone at my office. My, you know, can't be, could be reached on or whatever. So, yeah. but yeah, that addiction, you're so right, Peter, that, that to technology and then also how it drives Dan, what you were saying, how it drives, you know, the, the materialistic side of life, you know, where y you want your kids to dream and ha and and believe that they can achieve and, and have nice things that they've worked hard for and those kind of right. things. But also, um, you know, to teach them, how do we teach our kids gratitude and thanksgiving and contentment 
in a world that, you know, is so bombarded with so much. It's, you know, it's a blessing to live in a wealthy culture, but it's a curse too. And it's a double-edged sword. And so, um, I, I just, I mean, there's that scripture, you know, where Paul says godliness with contentment is great gain. Um, and I've always thought of that as trying to teach my own kids. Like I want them to, to see their dad living, even though I'm a middle-class guy, I live in a middle-class neighborhood. Um, there's people on our street with nicer things than us. Um, but I want my, my kids to, to see in their dad that this perspective that I feel like I'm the richest man in the neighborhood when I walk out my door because I've got contentment in my life and all these people that are in debt up to their eyeballs and they're barely, you know, they're living this, like, look at me and they're, and they're so unhappy behind the scenes. Um, I want to teach my kids that, you know, riches, real riches, um, is, is not dependent upon your income level. Um, yes, achieve, yes, plan. Yes. Try to get yourself squared away for retirement. Nothing wrong with those kind of things. Uh, become independently wealthy, mostly so that you can help other people. I mean, I I believe in all of that, but, um, at the same time, man, contentment is the key to, to feeling yeah. wealthy. Because if you're, if you don't learn the art of contentment, you can make a billion a year and you're not, and, and you're not going to be, feel, it's like, okay, just, well, I got to make $1 more, you know? And so, yeah. so we do some practicals, you know, it's like, uh, technology shouldn't be the first thing we go to in the morning. Technology shouldn't be the last thing we do at night. Uh, we did an episode on it on our show. Um, so there's, there's schedules, there's times they're allowed. And I think, you know, every kid is different. And so the technology affects them differently. Um, and, you know, you see the behavior change when they're on it too much. So I think it's just a, a give and take. It's a balance of trying to uh, know your kid, know what is is there. Because like you said, I want my kid to dream. Mm-hmm. That's why I allowed my daughter to start her YouTube channel because she's creative. Mm-hmm. She is a creative. And so uh, this is a vehicle for her to express that creativity. And so we've said, okay, this is a reason why you can have it. Um, for my son, I don't think it would be good for him. I think he would get addicted and it would be a problem. So, you know, uh, we'll probably cross that bridge down the line when he's a little bit older, but, uh, I think it's about knowing your kid, setting up healthy habits, um, you know, creating time where you're not on technology. And so unfortunately I think that means for me, I can't be on it either. You know, it's kind of like we need to do it as a family kind of thing. And so, you know, having a Sabbath, taking a day off, whatever it looks like, put the phone away, do family time be intentional. I think all of our kids face entitlement, you know, because they are, they are blessed. They're hooked up. You know, they got phones and AirPods and laptops, stuff that we never had, which thank God, right. They're blessed. But, uh, it's about, you know, me teaching them, uh, that you're in control of it. It's not in control of you. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was just thinking about, like I said, in the beginning, your guys' sobriety, I'm sure there's things that you guys learned on how to live in a life, uh, surrounded by stuff that could be a, 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 and addictive. Mm. How do you walk through life? I think, you know, whatever those tips are, you can apply that to the technology stuff and oh, yeah. create those boundaries and the healthy habits and all those things. Uh, but again, it's a tool. And so it does good stuff, but we just don't want to let it get in control of us. So mm. that's kind of where we've landed. Yeah. Real practicals. Well, you mentioned your podcast too. I just wanted to plug it. It's number five. It's episode five technology tug of war. Right. And I know Jess and I listened to that on our way out to Napa and it's really good. So I'd recommend it to any uh, moms and dads dealing with technology stuff get some more appreciate that insight around that too but yeah it's, it's such a great like topic but a hard one too at the same time i went to rehab mm-hmm. they take your phone <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you can't have it for a week yeah but i realized after that first week i don't think i want to look at that right now yeah. i didn't touch it for the 31 days that I was there, I didn't even see my oh. phone. I didn't, I didn't see it until I got out. And guess what I missed? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's right. I didn't have it for That's 31 days thing. and I missed nothing. nothing. Yeah. You know, it's like. You don't too, like no. after. I've done two uh, flip, I call it the flip phone challenge. So it's kind of a pain in the butt, but I've gone back to, I bought a flip phone like a couple of years ago and I just kept it. And then um, I've done, the first time I did it, I think I did almost three months. So I just swapped out the iPhone and put it in the drawer. And then I went just to the flip phone. So I could basically only get calls. And then I did it recently again. And it was, it was the most, it was amazing. It was great. Yeah. Like I just felt like free, you know? <laughs> and then of course I got drawn back in cause it was like, Oh, I need the app group me for baseball or that was one of them. Yeah. And then you're back on it. But it's, it's, um, 
But we were it's t- flat out addictive. We were talking oh, yeah. about last night. You're still off of social media. You're t- you're taking I, a hiatus. I, I am. I don't have it. I took it off my phone about a month ago. My Instagram. Yeah. I still have it, of course. You know, because yeah. I still and I, I check in on my on my um, on my Mac. You know, maybe once a week, once every other week, just to see if I have some messages or something. But the scrolling piece of it is, yeah. and it's so. That's why it, just it takes you so, so long much. to respond to the reels I send you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like a week later and I see Jeremy sends me something He's from like, Zyre oh. Call. I'm like, yeah. oh, I forgot about that one. <laughs> but it'll take us back to, to the yeah. beginning when I said how I met him. I was like stalking him, trying to, you know. And I sent, like I sent him an Instagram message. And I'm like, weeks went by. I'm like, this thing's not answering me. Come on, man. And yeah. finally, like a month later, he was like, yeah, I never checked this thing. Here's my number. Shoot me a text. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I just, you know, I don't know. I have, it's a, it's a love hate, I think with social media and I see that there's good stuff to it. Um, and I also think there's a lot of crappy stuff that it comes with it too, you know? Yeah. Um, I think yeah. one of the challenges too, is just how uh, easily accessible you are. Um, and then I, I feel like guilt pressure to get back to people as, as, <laughs> yeah. as soon as possible. And it just can plague me sometimes, you know, cause yeah. I'm a people pleaser. And so, I just, uh, I remember we uh, talked about that when you yeah. and, uh, April and Jess and I went to Cattleman's I think okay, we went yeah, to that yeah. night, and you were talking about like between Facebook, Instagram, yeah. you know, and you have people yeah. hitting you up all the time sure. for work stuff, prayer. Yeah. I mean, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you do. You feel like obligated to respond. You know, what's the worst. Okay. Let's get on this one. Um, the group chats. Oh. <laughs> Everyone had the same response. Oh, yeah. dude. I, yeah, that's the, that one drives me insane. Yeah. Like I don't turn on notifications. Say I may, I'm going off. Yeah. They can oh. have their conversation and I'll chime in when I'll catch up later. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Do not disturb. <laughs> Airplane mode is the, is the most, yeah. is the best productivity app. To- oh yeah. That's, that is a good one. I always love too when someone's like, Hey, uh, how, how do I get out of this group or how, take me out of this group? Yes, Someone yeah. just says it just oh, I know, lightly. Right? I always laugh. That's me. Yeah, yeah that's me. Yes. I don't want to be in this. No. And there's always that one person who is really inappropriate in the group chat. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Just like, awesome. Could you just post that? Do you, do you know mom's in here? Do you know mom's in this group? Chat? I'm usually that guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually me. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, good stuff, man. Love it. So how are you guys feeling? How are we thinking about this? What else are we going to talk about here? Do we got to go? What's uh, You got to drive to L.A. tonight, bro. You're, you're so, crazy. Well, you got, you so know, good. You got, got tied to I got 21-year-old Ty share. with me. Yeah, yeah uh, Dan brought his 21-year-old nephew, Ty. He's hanging out with us, too. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Just down a bang and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That's right. Hop on five. <laughs> yeah. But you know, when you, when you're talking about like being on the level with certain things and how you treat your kids and different things, like hanging out with Ty, Ty and I keep each other in check pretty well because mm-hmm. we're incredibly honest with each other. Um, but I'm able to tell him when he's a young, naive idiot and, and just, he's totally clueless about <laughs> something but he's able to tell me when I'm just being like the old fart guy, like how, because <laughs> yeah, I already, cool. I already yeah. do with him. Well, when I was your age, yeah. you know, and he's looking at me like, bro, seriously, yeah. you know? really? Like, come on. <laughs> and it's easier to hear that from your nephew than from your son for some reason. Oh yeah. I, yeah like when I your son tells you you're an idiot, you're like, yeah, yeah but I raised Wait, you. Like, really? Like, I thought I, I was cool. For you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I could still take you out. Uh, and yeah, we, right. we get confused sometimes. Cause sometimes I like, I feel like I'm his boy. You know, but then other times something will happen and I'll realize that I could be his dad. You know? <laughs> We're a little conflicted there. Yeah. This is not fair to him. He doesn't have his own mic to. I know. Express He's just hanging out. No, I'm good to him. I'm good to him. <laughs> yeah, I think it's great, dude. I, and I, I uh, you know, I think it does help kind of keep you in check and keep you a little young too, like young mm-hmm. spirited. Um, and, I don't know. Like there's a certain, do you guys feel like you, the older you get, like the less cool you get? Oh, no <laughs> like, question. I'm just like, I, w- I was so concerned back in the day with being cool. And like, I just don't care anymore. 
<laughs> like I just feel and like my, my kid, they're like, dads. And I'm like, I thought that was funny. I guess it's a total dad joke. Now I'm like in dad joke mode these oh. days, you know? Oh yeah. I'm there. I'm just, I'm coming to accept. There's all kinds of reminders. It. I told yeah. you about, I was, it, this is just like this past summer. I'm at the golf course in Davis and this like cute cart girl comes <laughs> up and, you know, and I'm buying something to drink and something to yeah. eat from her and everything. And, you know, and she's real bubbly and, and, uh, she just looks at me and goes, uh, Hey, do you have a son that goes to, uh, uh, you know, whatever college I said, no, no, he didn't go there. I do have a son, but I, and, and she goes, Oh, okay. Cause you look a lot like his dad. <laughs> And I'm going, okay, that's the category I'm in. There it is. Sweet. Here we are. (laughs) Joke's on her. You're a grandpa. Right. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. I know. That's funny. It's humbling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I spent so long trying to, um, trying to be cool. Right. But I, because I wanted other people's approval for it too. That's what it was. Like I wanted you to think that I was cool. And I think now whether I'm cool or I'm not, like, I just don't care. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's like, like my biggest thing, he, we always joke or whatever. is like, I live in sweatpants now. <laughs> like what happened during the pandemic is it's stuck. I left the jeans and everything behind. Like yeah. when I tell you, I haven't put on a pair of jeans since the pandemic. Yeah. Like I have not put on wow. a pair of jeans. I don't wear pants anywhere uh, anymore. I wear sweatpants. No, that's amazing. It doesn't matter. Like I have a nice pair of green Lululemons. When my wife <laughs> asked me to get dressed up, that's what I'm putting on. Nice. Let's get dressed up. So what up. about at work when you're you on can, TV? Do you just get to wear like a, like, are you like business up front, it's party like, down below? Yeah, it's board some shorts kind of like, and... I'll do like some sort of <laughs> jogger on the bottom. It's yes. like as far as I'll that's go so towards amazing. dress. Because I just, if you don't think it's cool, like I just don't care anymore. Yeah. You know? Don't care. I think that's the age I'm at. Like, you know, where my wife will still think I'm cool sometimes, you know, but my kids, like that ship has sailed. They're just not going to think I'm cool. And that's okay. I love the point of approval that you brought up though, because that was something that was a huge struggle, like of wanting to be accepted, wanting to be loved, wanting to be liked, um, wanting to feel, um, valued and important almost too. So like striving to do these things to seek this outer approval Mm -hmm. was exhausting. Totally exhausting. Like, and now I'll say, I just don't care. (laughs) Don't really care. (laughs) That's it. And it's so, it's so free. Like, all right. Is that kind of like a natural progression? You know, you, you're, that's like your teens and twenties. It's kind of like approval. 30s and 40s, you're kind of like figuring life out a little bit. You start yeah. to get into that. I don't really care. I yeah. want to wear sweatpants and that's fine by me. <laughs> yeah. and uh, when I don't, I don't ever want to get to the point like where I don't care that I'm just like yeah. a sloppy uh, mess, yeah. you know, like, I, but like, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't need that approval yeah. anymore. Um, and I think it is something with a, and it probably goes back to the point I, he- I heard from Bill Cooper, who was like, don't marry a man until he's 40 because like, <laughs> you know, or roughly that because we just, you know, there's a lot of things to work on, but yeah, it's very, um, relieving to not have to carry that weight around. I think of trying to impress people or trying to like, no, know it all. That's another one too. I know all the answers. I mean, I don't yeah. know Jack. <laughs> like, uh, I know. And that's the, be- like someone asked something, well, what is this? And like the best answer I can ever come up with. It's so amazing is just, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, like, I don't know. No. Maybe we can find out. I don't, you know, it's so much simpler, you know, but it's being okay with that being the answer. Totally. Being able to say, I don't know. And I not care. Everything you're talking about goes back. I, I won't say it as nice as you did. You had a good quote, but about contentment. Mm. it's that you know being happy with where you're at feeling good with where you're at with who you're surrounded by like when I was chasing that cool I was chasing everything I didn't even know what I was chasing but I was I was constantly chasing I mean I can bring it all in now I was constantly chasing everything I saw on social media yeah and everything saw where other people were going what they were doing where they were living I was chasing more followers I was chasing anything I could you know, and not realizing that I had a beautiful wife and two wonderful kids sitting right next to me. Right there. And yeah. like, and that was like the strangest thing when I came, when I was sitting in, in, in my, just my worst place, 
during the pandemic when work was gone and yeah. travel was gone and all that was taking away from me. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, and I used the word just on purpose. I was thinking now I'm just a dad and just mm -hmm. a husband. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to do with that. Wow. You know, yeah. and realizing like that was the greatest thing in my life. Totally. But I, yeah. I didn't get that. It's like you already had what everybody wants. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know? And so now realizing that and loving that the other stuff, I mean, there's stuff I want and I hope sure. I get, but it's just not that big of a deal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. if it happens, it's it happens. It doesn't matter. That's, that's beautiful. Cause uh, it took uh, something pretty big to kind of teach us that lesson. Right. I mean, it took a pandemic shutdown. Or yeah. to get that perspective of uh, just how how much we have and how unimportant those other things are, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. I know the pandemic sucked, but you're right. There was a lot of, um, and it's all about perspective, I guess, too. But there was a lot of good things that did come out of it. A lot of realizations. Um, people, a lot of, a lot of crappy stuff. Too, people but, pivoted, yeah. well, big time. You know, <laughs> yeah. pivoted in life. Yeah, made big adjustments. I wish I would have invested in Zoom tell you that oh, much that would have oh. been a nice move like 2017 yeah. or something oh, i'm gonna buy a little bit of zoom stock <laughs> just like exploded oh man so is there anything that uh any of us are maybe a goal for this you know we're in the new year it's resolution time not everybody subscribes to that but is there anything that we're as men like this is something i want to grow in this year maybe as pertaining to family kids your spouse maybe your own health or whatever that is or anything that you guys have like put on the, on the, uh, the dream board, <laughs> you know, to, to try yeah. and uh, tackle this year to get better at. Yeah. I mean, I can speak about my wife. Um, and I don't even know how I'm going to do it yet. It's part of the reason I asked you the question about, <laughs> about going to couples therapy. I, the, the, the transition or the, the move I made when I came home, feeling like a different guy and how I was able to pour so much of that into my kids. My relationship with my kids is off the charts. Now it's, mm -hmm. it's beyond, I'm like the dad that I always thought I would be. That's, oh, that's the dad awesome. I am now, mm -hmm. which is awesome. That's cool. Um, and my wife or my wife and I are fantastic, but I'm not there with her. Yeah. Like I am with the kids. Right. And that needs work. And so I've said to myself that this year, that's something I'm going to, spend time on and try to figure out and you know and I, again i don't know how i'm going to do it but i'm putting conscious effort in that direction because with the kids if if it was easy yeah it was like they were there ready you know for whatever i could give them right you now um i think my relationship with my wife is is more complicated and it takes more work than yeah, that that's um, true yeah so i need true. to to put effort towards that godspeed <laughs> that's good yeah <laughs> I think all of us would definitely encourage you in that, bro. Yeah, like yeah. keep going on that because you're on the right path. You're on the right track. Right. And it's just going to take a little bit of that faith, just diving in and going for it, dude. And you're, you're right there, bro. And you're going to see like, you're going to see huge return. It ain't going to be easy at times, but you, I think Peter was saying er earlier, maybe it was Jeremy, but just the, the connection it's a whole different connection that you start to build yeah. with your, even through some of the hard stuff that you got to work out. Um, I know for Jess and I, it's been tough, but it's made us definitely stronger, mm -hmm. dude. So keep it up, bro. You're, yep. you're on it. And I think even <clears throat> just having that conversation is, is so valuable. Just saying, Hey, this is my intention. I want to get to a better place, not because we're messed up, but because I just, I yeah. think there's something more mm -hmm. and, and just inviting it and do it together. I think that's so healthy, you know? And so, those are but, awkward uh, but, conversations that, you know, sometimes, but just saying, here's what I'm thinking. Can we try this? And, uh, and, and open being that open, I think I'm thinking about your wife listening to this episode and her hearing you say that she's going to be yeah. like, let's go. Yeah. Let's go. That's yeah. amazing. That's, you know, that's sexy, whatever. So, you know, just being able to say, I want to, I want to grow. I think that's like amazing for them. Our spouses. Good. But, but I know you're going to go, but real, I just no, want to say one, one thing. Like, I hope that this, topic of just even the, um, you know, counseling therapy. I really hope that it helps somebody else out there just start to break down some of that stigma with it. Yeah. Because back to your point of everybody having a coach, 
Michael Jordan had a, I mean, that's the classical Michael Jordan had a coach, you know, like go down the list of dudes or, or men, women who are amazing. We'll just say athletes, um, pilots, who, who, whatever it is, you always have a mentor. You always have a coach. So why would we ever think in life that we didn't need some sort of outside counsel to help us get through marriage, parenting, finances. work, finances, yeah. go down the list of all those things. There's been this whole stigma created around it that it's a bad thing. And that like you, like you said, you're not messed up like that, that you are though. People think, Oh, you, Oh, you go to counseling. You must be really jacked up. You, your yeah. marriage must be terrible. Cause you go to therapy. Like really like, nah, I'm trying to get on point with my marriage. Yeah. I'm trying to do the best job I can do and lead my family as a father and stuff. So just anyone out there who's listening has got doubts about that, or you've heard that before. It's so it's BS. Like right. it's, you need a coach That's like right. period. And so a lot of options out there for that. So good, Shane. Um, for me, uh, I, I've never been in my adult life. I, well, I guess I was earlier on and, and now I'm not, I haven't been for many years, uh, a, a new year's resolution guy because I guess probably because I failed at so many of the early tries <laughs> and I just figured, hey, you know, it d- doesn't matter if it's January 1st, it's, it's still gonna fail. Um, so, but this year, I, I just, for me, I know that there's a, um, there's a few people in my life that, and it's a small handful, I've got such a blessed life and so many good relationships. There's, there's a couple people in particular, maybe three, that um, are, have been really difficult people for me to proactively love. Um, I've forgiven them for things that, uh, that have wounded me. I've, um, I've let go of things. I've, um, but I've, I've sort of just held them at arm's distance. And I'm not talking about like toxic people who are going, that are so toxic that, that I shouldn't be pursuing. I'm, I'm just talking about people that I probably need to do a better job of just proactively finding ways to love. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm so that, so that's one thing that's heavy on my heart as I start this new year is to pursue this, this handful of people that, um, I feel like I've, uh, you know, they probably think I want nothing to do with them because they probably think I'm mad at them for what they've done to me or whatever. And I just, how do I broach that and say, you know what, we don't have to be best friends, but I just want you to know you're valued. I love you. Um, yeah. and, uh, if you ever need me, I want to be here for you. Um, so whatever that means, you know, I just, I just love the scripture talks about as far as it depends on you, do everything possible to live at peace with everyone, right? And so, um, not every not every forgiveness story is going to end in reconciliation because forgiveness can be one way, but reconciliation has to be two ways, right? So if yeah. they're not ready to reconcile, or whatever, you can't force that. But uh, but I do I want to do whatever I can to love more proactively, love these rather than just ignore them, uh, yeah. just more proactively love these difficult people. And I don't know why because I don't it's 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 not going to bring me anything in, in the sense of like, make me like, it's not, it's no, nothing selfish in it, but I guess that's the cool thing about it is I just feel yeah. like God is leading me to just sort of say, Hey, for whatever it's worth, I, I do love you. And, and uh, so does that mean actually reaching out to these people or is it like, what is that? Part? I'm totally, I'm yeah, totally open to it. And I, yeah. they're unique situations. And, and uh, like I said, again, I, I, I don't have a lot of these things. I'm truly blessed with like so many positive and loving relationships in my life. So, so it's, but this handful, uh, one of them's a, a, a dis, you know, a, an extended family member and, and then a couple of other friends in my life, uh, you know, or acquaintances. Yeah. Um, and I just feel like I want to be, I just want to be an extension of, of God's grace into people's lives. And these are a handful of areas where I feel like I could just at least, I would feel better knowing that I did everything on my end to really yeah. go after them and just say, Hey, I, if you, if you want me in your life, I, I love you. We don't have to be best friends or anything, but I don't want there to be awkwardness between us or disappointment yeah. or that kind of thing. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I think for me, um, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but just, uh, some stuff came up in this last year and I, I got counseling and I worked on it. And like I said, I kind of saw the fruit of being a better parent because of it. And so I think that's kind of my goal is just to continue to work on me so that I can try to be the healthiest I can to provide the best parent to my kids and the best spouse to my wife, you know, if that makes sense. So that's kind of one for me is, you know, working on the, the hard stuff yeah. through counseling, through um, mentors, through, through coaches, and just working on the stuff that's uncomfortable so that I can give my kids the best version of me that I can. I think, you know, that's kind of yeah. like one of those things for me. 
So, you know, there's other stuff that I put on the bucket list, but at the end of the day, like we said, what, what's most important is, is them. So yeah, that's a big one. I, I'm, yeah. I got to keep working on me so I can be the best, you know, and obviously that comes from me that comes back to you as well, spending more time with God and talking to God and hearing from God, because I find that I have more grace for people and my kids and everything else uh, when I do that more. So it's a, it's a mix of both. Yeah, that's nice. It's so funny. If, it, if I heard that two years ago, I would have been like, how selfish could you be? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it's about you. You got to do work on you, you know, but yeah. now I, I completely get that because if you're, if you're right, you have so much more to give to everybody around you, so true. you know, yep. but I never understood that before ever. <laughs> yeah. And life will teach us that, right? Yeah. <laughs> what about yeah. you, Shane? It's such yeah. an epiphany that, oh, I can't give what I don't have. <laughs> huh. I know. Yeah. That's crazy. What a my, concept. My cup is empty. <laughs> I have nothing left. Um, yeah. So we, we, did a, we did the old classic word, you know, what's your word for the year? Mm. Done that a couple times. I can't remember what Jess's word was now. Was, this is about you. I know, but I <laughs> just was thinking about that for a second. But she said, what, what's your word? And my word for this year was Jesus. Like just plain and simple. <laughs> um, I really want to, let's keep it simple. I'm in hot pursuit. And uh, I feel like he's been in hot pursuit. And well, not even in pursuit, but just always been there. Even when I haven't recognized it or known it. Uh, even back to when I was a kid. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm just trying not to overthink it too. And do, and I'm just going to, or very, or just like with, I feel like with your situation, Jeremy, like even when you were describing it, it just sounded so organic and just like, I don't really know why, you know what I mean? This is just, I can feel that it's just going to flow and happen though. So with that kind of a little applicable part that I did put together with, um, at the same time was like, I created these like five core tenets because I have a tendency to not or question stuff and not know, like it, it could be very confusing at times. So it was like faith, family, fitness, vocation, finances, those five in that order. And I feel like it's given me almost like, um, like a, you know, like a, uh, what's it called? When you steer the ship in a sense, I guess, or whatever. Um, to where when I do start to question stuff or if I'm going down a path that seems like I don't, I don't know, I can go back to one of those and go, does it fit in one of these? Okay, it doesn't, then I, then I probably shouldn't be going down that path. I need to make a, a quick you know, left or whatever. Uh, and then if it does, then I can kind of address it from there too. But um, if anything, I feel like it's kind of helped to wrap a lot of stuff then when my mind can kind of go all different ways it's kind of helped bring it together. So like that foundation of Jesus of God, um, like number one, and then the, the rest of it, I feel like falls in into place because p p family parenting, being a husband, right. like all of that. And so I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, we'll see how the year goes. So there's going to be some ups and downs and stuff, but I'm super excited. And I just want to tell you guys that I love you. Um, I'm so happy to do this today. Like this was so fun. Yeah. Like today yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> I, and I, I know that it, like, I don't think you guys understand like how much this means to me right now, because it just, it's been, um, I have been battling over the last probably three, four months, you know? Um, and it's been hard to talk about stuff. I've talked about it here and there, but just to sit back and just hang out and just, um, talk a little bit and laugh and just be with my homies like is really awesome. So thank you guys, man. It's been really, really cool. Yep. Love it. Thanks, Thanks man. For having it's us been on. great to be yeah. here. Absolutely. We got to give it up for Dan for the commuter award. Yeah. Dude, yeah. Here, wait. <laughs> I got it right this time. There we go. Ah, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> He's the real MVP yeah. here. Driving down all the way to Los Angeles in the night. But Ty's helping. You're helping, Ty. Ty's helping. Ty's coming to clutch. <laughs> yeah. So be sure to check out Dan's podcast, if I'm being honest. Um, Jeremy at Valley Church. You can check out the Valley Church podcast. Uh, Peter and Heather, No Greater Joy podcast. Um, you can find them all on iTunes, Spotify, everywhere. Any of that stuff. Social media. You guys want to give social media stuff out? If anyone, I don't, I don't, you know, 
hate social media. We talked about it. Don't matter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. I can, I yeah, can pretend like that. I'm not all over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any uh, well, any any final words, thoughts, encouragement before we uh, before we wrap up tonight, fellas? I, I told you. I just want to commend you on ten years. How many years in are oh, you? Thank you for sobriety. I'm um, a year and eight months. Nice, sweet. Man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's something guys don't say well or they don't say enough. Yeah. I'm proud of you. Yeah, thank you. I don't even For know sure, you man. yet, <laughs> but uh, just what you've overcome and what you're able to do now to help yeah. other people and for the purpose of your family uh, as a as a man, uh, I just I appreciate your hard work, and uh, I thank you, Shane, for you know just pioneering this way for us. You know, he's been a he's been a uh, a great support to me, jumping into podcast land, helping me. So awesome, man! I appreciate the support here at the table, and uh, you guys are some great men. It's good to know you. Thank you. Thank you. Feelings thanks, mutual. Peter. Well, hey, man, thanks for having me on. This is the second time I've been able to be on your podcast. And uh, uh, it's a joy to know you, Shane, and, and uh, you as well, Peter, and just a fellow uh, spiritual leader in the area. And to get to meet you, Dan's awesome. Thanks, man. Um, I'll just say uh, for those that are, you know, wrestling with um, – with, uh, addiction or, or, uh, on some aspect of the recovery journey, you know, um, one of my favorite things from the Bible is when Jesus says, um, it is not the well who need a doctor, but the sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Um, I think that explains the heart of Jesus right there. And so be patient with yourself because he's patient with you. Uh, he loves you exactly as you are and not as you think you should be. And he loves you way too much to leave you in the mess you're in. So don't lose faith in that. That's good. Heck yeah. I don't know how I'm going to follow that up. That's pretty good. But other than it was, you know, wonderful to meet you guys. And Shane, I, I don't know what your next trick is, you know, but you were there when I first got out of rehab. And now, you know, a year and a half or whatever later, here we are doing this. So uh, I just look forward to uh, continuing yeah. the relationship and appreciate everything, yeah. man. Absolutely, man. Thank you, bro. But yeah, may, hey, maybe maybe a live, maybe something live more often, man. Who knows? We'll yeah. see. We'll see where this path goes. Well, thanks for tuning in today, everyone. Make sure you check out all the podcasts. We love you guys. 